Okay, I think that'd be our time. Should we get started? All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Sumer Johal. I'm the executive director of AgStack, which is a project of the Linux Foundation that deals with digital infrastructure for food and ag. Uh, today, we're actually unveiling a very exciting sub-project uh, called the Field Carbon Model sub-project. So AgStack is an umbrella project within the Linux Foundation. We have several sub-projects. Uh, and this is a very uh, uh, important first step in a longer journey, and we hope that you'd appreciate it and join this journey with us. As with everything open source, it's really about the evolution, and so with that, we'll jump right into it. All this work is available on GitHub, and that's the link. Um, so let's first talk quickly about the motivation uh, behind what we're doing. So first, uh, you know, from a broad perspective, uh, agriculture can really provide a very powerful solution. It can be a, a net positive solution for climate change crisis. Uh, and really through carbon sequestration at scale. The challenge with that is that we need, as a key enabler of that, a ve verifiable, trusted, and global and, and, and really cheap uh, field-specific carbon accounting system that accounts for what carbon is sequestered on a field in a way that people can find believable. Okay? And that, if one, that happens, that is a necessary, perhaps not sufficient, but a very necessary step in the enablement of agriculture to be essentially a solution for carbon-based uh, for carbon uh, climate change mitigation. Um, so for that uh, key challenge and key enabler, we are here to solve three key problems through what we like to call MRV, or what the industry calls MRV, which is measurement, reporting, and verification. The first is to bring transparency to the actual methodology, which is a lot of times opaque, it's not really understood, and we want to change that completely. Number two is to enable scientific consensus. So there's lots of scientists doing lots of things along this area, but a lot of their work gets published in papers. That is not a digital uh, enabled solution that could be really worked like code. And so really create a way for the scientific consensus around code. And third is to reduce the cost through using and leveraging remote sensing and other digital met methods of MRV so that you can actually do this at field scale globally. Those are the three big challenges around MRV today. So what we are doing is our intended design, again, this is a first step in a much longer journey, is to really create an open source model repository with the first model in that repo, which is already there today, which we've created just recently. And this model is going to have three levels of models. So the levels of models are sort of important. The first one is the remote only. Second one is remote plus in situ metrology. And third one is remote, in situ, and activity on a field. So imagine an agriculture field anywhere in the world. Those would be the three levels of models. Each one will evolve as a separate code base, but all three are important at different levels of sort of granularity. We want to design this from a vendor-independent manner, so no one vendor should be favored in this, in terms of enabling this. But it's also important that we engage private sectors and make it vendor-friendly to adopt and use while making sure it's independent and completely transparent. And today's sort of version 0.01 .01 that you'll see today is actually designed from multiple data sources, from multiple uh, agencies that are all planetary data sources. Uh, Sentinel-2 is satellite data, Merit-2 comes from NASA, SMAP and Merit-2 both comes from NASA, USDA crop data layer provides the machine learning for crop uh, classification, and Soil Grids presents the soil information from around the world. So very first order, on-field, field carbon model. That's what we're trying to do. Uh, let me introduce you to our panel. The first two people on our panel are going to present through a video. They couldn't be here today. Uh, Dr. Arthur Ensley is a research scientist at the Numerical Terradynamic Simulation Group, or NTSG, at the University of Montana. He and John Kimball have been really uh, the, the pillars of the NASA SMAP work that has been going on in carbon fluxes for the last decade. Um, and John Kimball and Jerry Hatfield are co-chairs of our Technical Advisory Committee. Uh, Dr. Jerry Hatfield has uh, been at USDA as a remote science specialist and agroecologist for over 40 years, just recently retired, and has joined a company called Agrologics, which actually I founded as a chief scientist. Uh, and we're really delighted to have uh, Dr. Jerry uh, Hatfield as well weighing in on the Technical Advisory Committee. 
Heather Atkinson is actually the uh, you know, technology professional uh, for the last couple of decades in technology and a principal technical program manager at our peer sister project called OS Climate at the Linux Foundation. And so we are now you know, doing this sort of cross project work to go after common goals, which is I'm delighted about, so welcome Heather. Uh, and then Brian King is an agriculture data expert and head of digital and data innovation accelerator at the CGIAR, and, which is a global research institution consortium of agriculture scientists. And so we have this great panel that'll get into it. Uh, and with that, let me start with our first video and uh, introduced by Dr. Arthur Ensley. Hi, my name is Arthur Ensley, and I'm a research scientist at the University of Montana. Today, I'm excited to talk to you about the work that we're doing with CMER and AgStack on field scale carbon flux estimation. I want to acknowledge that Dr. John Kimball has also contributed to this work as a member of the AgStack Technical Advisory Committee. John and I both work at the University of Montana's Numerical Teradynamic Simulation Group, or NTSG, which was founded in 1987 by Nobel laureate Dr. Steve Running. Steve and others at our lab developed foundational techniques in modeling weather and ecosystems. You might recognize the names of some of the models we've developed. We also generated the first global, continuous, and weekly estimates of ecosystem gross and net primary production, which you may know as the MODIS Mod 17 product. More recently, we are supporting NASA's Soil Moisture Active Passive, or SMAP, mission through our ongoing development and maintenance of the SMAP Level 4 Carbon product, which provides a global daily carbon budget. This carbon budget is made possible by upscaling observed CO2 fluxes from eddy covariance flux towers, such as the one you see on the left here. These towers and L4C both provide estimates of the net exchange of CO2 between ecosystems and the atmosphere. To do that, we quantify the difference between the CO2 released as part of heterotrophic respiration and the CO2 assimilated by plants as part of net primary production. This balance is related to the soil organic carbon state at a given time, which we're also able to estimate for surface soils. L4C has been an active development and annual recalibration since 2015. We've had several opportunities to demonstrate the value of this near real-time product. As one example, the recent Great Plains flash drought of 2017 showcased the potential for products like L4C to estimate the impacts of short-term climatic variation on carbon uptake and storage in terrestrial ecosystems. L4C predicted strong declines in GPP that were consistent with independent reports of low crop yields and poor rangeland conditions. Our new partnership with AgStack is focused on applying these types of models at field scale. We envision three levels of development and application. Level one is already available, free and open source on GitHub, as I'll demonstrate in a moment. We're using a model similar to L4C, along with downscale vegetation indices and globally available gridded climate data sets to estimate field scale carbon fluxes. In level two, we plan to incorporate field-based micrometeorology and sensor data to improve the fidelity of these estimates for specific fields. And finally, at level three, we plan to provide support for integrating field management activities. So with that said, I'd like to show you a brief demonstration of our current capabilities. So this is a Jupyter Notebook um, that's available with the open source uh, AgStack software on GitHub right now. Uh, I'm going to import some libraries for uh, numerical data analysis and plotting. And I want to show this map. Um, I'm going to be showcasing one uh, field just north of uh, Des Moines, I Iowa today. Um, this is a satellite view of uh, one of actually two fields in this area that we're, that we're working on. Um, this code block right here shows pretty much all the code that's needed to um, get up and running with a simple estimate of the net carbon balance for this field. Um, I'm going to walk through each one of these steps, but I just want to demonstrate um, how quick this can run for a single field, um, straight to getting an estimation of the net carbon balance. So what are the steps involved here? Um, well, first we need to read in some data. Um, this, you know, maybe um, something that you can get from something like Earth Engine. We're also developing tools to make it easier to access gridded climate data sets, um, like the ones that are used to run the terrestrial carbon flux model in this, in this demonstration. Um, but you can see this is just a CSV file for one field. 
um, for multiple fields or for, or for say, gridded data, we might have a three-dimensional data cube. Um, and if we have multiple pixels or model res resolution cells that uh, we're estimating fluxes in. Um, so that's what our data look like. I've got two fields here. I'm just going to stack those data sets together. Um, the soil organic carbon state, I can get a good initial estimate of that from the soil grids 250 meter product, um, and that's available globally at 250 meters. So it's something that um, you could also use for a field that you're interested in, or you might have field data. Um, I do need to kind of guess the SSC content as it's distributed through three different uh, soil organic carbon pools. Um, so I'll just start with uh, this initial estimate which um, is pretty low for the surface soils for the top five centimeters, um, but it's okay because we'll address that in a moment. The last thing I need to do is just read in some model parameters. These come from the SMAP level four carbon product. Um, this parameter dictionary is freely available through the National Snow and Ice Data Center, but it's also included in the repository. And I've indicated that um, these two fields, they both have a, a code associated with a certain land cover type, in this case, uh, serial croplands. So step two, um, I just need to spin up the model, just um, get the soil organic carbon state to a uh, pseudo equilibrium. And then I'm already uh, able to kind of plot some of the outputs from this model. I can see my two fields um, started out of balance in terms of uh, the, into the change in the annual NEE sum from year to year, but they converge pretty quickly. Um, to a threshold that I can choose and change if I want to get a closer estimate. Um, so now I have soil organic carbon pools that are much more realistic for surface soils in this particular region. Um, and I can just uh, sum up the three pools if I want to get a total estimate of soil organic carbon. The final state is uh, simulation. This is the fun part. Um, so again, we estimate the constituent carbon fluxes like GPP and heterotrophic respiration as well. Um, I can estimate GPP. This is com a completely vectorized calculation, so I can get a time series of GPP pretty quickly. Um, we can see that this time series data set uh, encompasses um, almost two entire growing seasons. Um, if I want to get um, net ecosystem exchange, I do need to run the model forward because the model soil organic carbon state uh, is dynamic and will change over time. Um, but this runs pretty quickly for just two fields. and um, one interesting plot I could make of this particular example, because both of these fields really share the same kind of surface meteorology, is what is the difference in net ecosystem exchange between these two fields? Um, we can see that it's fairly small, but we can attribute this to the different soil sort of organic carbon content that's found in, in each field. We can see that um, there is uh, a greater difference um, in spring for these two fields. Um, in summer, um, we see that the difference is here probably not limited by water availability. So we just get a, a smooth, they're changing um, the amount of carbon, uh, the, the relative difference in carbon, just according to uh, a change in temperature in the available um, soil organic carbon as it, as it builds up seasonally and then decays seasonally as well. Um, so comparisons like this might be interesting to look at differences in different management histories or different management strategies for different fields. Um, and we're really just scratching the surface here. Um, I want to thank you for taking the time to attend this session today. And I'm sorry I can't be there in person, but I'm going to turn it over to um, Jerry Hatfield and uh, Sumer Jahal, who will tell you more about this. So running quickly, running quickly to the next one, um, we have a presentation from Dr. Jerry Hatfield. Um, Jerry's uh, career as a remote scientist, agroecologist, really weighs, brings the agriculture perspective into this. So you'll see a, a slightly different variation of the same sort of idea um, presented through Jerry. Takes a few seconds to load, so just bear with us. <clears throat> Good morning. I'm Jerry Hatfield. I'm one of the science uh, team at AgriLogics and uh, uh, retired uh, USDA uh, ARS uh, 
a laboratory director and plant physiologist and uh, work on the whole aspects of uh, how do we uh, understand the dynamics of carbon in uh, agricultural systems that uh, we can apply to uh, looking at carbon sequestration or uh, There's a slight delay as we go from one slide to another, so please bear with us. The gods of PowerPoint. You'd ask the question of why this interest of uh, in, in carbon and agriculture. Uh, if we look at this from a standpoint that uh, obviously carbon sequestration and uh, carbon markets drive this process, but you can really look at it from a different viewpoint and saying, you know, how much carbon is captured from the air and incorporated into the plant and the soil? Uh, and of that capture, how much uh, remains uh, in that uh, soil for sequestration? And we know there's a lot of discussion about the permanence of, of carbon in agricultural systems and what that means. If we look at this from a different perspective, uh, here's a, a corn can. Again, apologies for the choppiness. Perspective. But if you think about this pathway of carbon into the soil, uh, there's, there's a misconception in a lot of this that uh, many people think that CO2 from the air just automatically gets into that soil volume out there, but it's not a passive process as we see on that uh, components of the, the right side is that in order to put carbon into the soil, <clears throat> it requires a living plant to capture that carbon. And we transfer that carbon as a simple sugar uh, from the uh, plant into the soil. So when we look at this and you think about quantifying carbon dynamics at different spatial scales, on the left side, that's just the variation of uh, soil water holding capacity, which is a direct function of how much organic matter is in the soil. And then here's a, a picture of that soil profile. And so we have to ask ourselves the question of how do we effectively sample the vertical and horizontal variation? And just to put it in perspective, if it, we take 12 one inch cores per acre, uh, that volume only represents 1.5 to the 10 to the minus sixth of the volume. So if we look at the, where we're thinking about going uh, is how do we build a field scale carbon model framework. And if you just look at this, uh, we can begin to look at carbon sequestration as a function of how much below ground biomass is there uh, and then what agronomic practices affects that carbon loss. We know that tillage uh, puts a lot of carbon back in the atmosphere uh, and that we can add all this. And so utilizing these equations of, uh, of gross primary productivity and then net primary productivity, uh, we can derive this with different remote sensing methods. Uh, we can look at temperature. Re uh, and when it, we've been looking at how do we quantify field variation. So, uh, over time, uh, AgriLogics, uh, we built a, a system to begin to look at how do we effectively sample fields. So if you want to sample a field, there. 
And so ultimately what this requires is that we have to integrate multiple layers of data. Uh, we can start with remote sensing, then we can uh, add uh, field scale measurements, we can add uh, farmer measurements that uh, uh, colorful map and there is the yield map across fields. We can look at uh, what we have with soil survey results. So there, there's a great deal of information that we can bring into. Sorry about the choppiness. Sorry about that. Uh, I think uh, the, the, the main point was made, but the, some of the audio is cut off. So I can fill in the gaps later on for folks that uh, want to know more. Um, so with that, I'll hand it over to um, Heather uh, to present uh, the work that OS Climate is doing uh, in, in this area, and we look forward to uh, working together to move this project forward. Heather? Absolutely. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so OS Climate really is focused, uh, I'm going to kind of take it up a little bit uh, higher level than just the agriculture sector, but OS Climate is looking at what are the barriers that are preventing uh, investments from flowing to climate aligned solutions. And when we took a, a, a deep dive into that, we realized that people weren't making uh, those decisions because they didn't trust the data, they didn't have uh, transparency around that data, and they didn't have the right analytical tools to make those decisions. Uh, so OS Climate was formed with three goals in mind. One is to make sure we're creating an infrastructure, uh, what we're calling the data mesh, uh, that provides data that's trustworthy, that's transparent, that data scientists can uh, replicate results that you know one another uh, have regarding their models, and then also create multiple analytical tools that are needed by not only corporations, but financial institutions, uh, by uh, nonprofits by sovereigns themselves in terms of understanding what are the, the impacts uh, of climate change, not only from a physical risk perspective, but how are they going to make that transition? Because it's going to be trillions of dollars of investment that has to be made. And so having good tools that not only show transparent methodologies are kind of our key goals. You wanna to go to the next? So right now we have a community of uh, academic institutions that are providing the good science behind the models. We also have financial institutions and banks that really need to rethink how they're investing uh, that are part of our organization as well as a lot of IT and technology companies that are all coming together like Red Hat and Amazon are all partners. And like I said, we're pulling together a lot of the resources that people need to make these decisions, but we're doing it in a way where we're creating a data mesh, which is a federated data uh, platform where we're not copying, let's say, all the NASA data and all the NOAA data into one place, but we're federating with those sources so people can get access to the data, to the models, and uh, to the code that they need to be able to do the analysis on their own and make their own decisions and, and kind of have this ability to plug and play, because we know no one model is the right model, right? It's it's combining all of those together, looking at the the, the trajectories of those models and understanding what, what the potential impact is going to be. So we have three main uh, tools that are part of the OS Climate platform. One is on physical risk and resilience, so it's taking a look at the hazards that are out there, whether it's drought or flooding or uh, whatever peril you can think of and looking at what are the vulnerability of a set of assets. And those assets could be agriculture, right? They could be farms and fields, or they could be real estate. Uh, and having the ability for people to bring in their assets, assess those hazards, what's the vulnerability, and then what's the probability of, of the impact. And then once you know that, you can start to take a look at transition analysis and how are you going to transition uh, your, whether it's your corporation or your investment portfolio uh, um, into climate aligned uh, solutions. And then finally, sector alignment, what that takes a look at and where we see good synergies with the carbon model uh, is what are, what are the emissions, right? A lot of corporations, organizations have committed to net zero. What are their trajectory in achieving that goal and where are they at? And obviously agriculture uh, can provide a way to uh, sequester carbon and it's you know a carbon negative solution that we need. Go to the next slide, please. So just a quick, this is just an example of the physical risk uh, analysis tool. Uh, you can see we have a UI 
that in this particular case is looking at real estate and flood inundation uh, and coastal inundation and what's the impact of that climate hazard of coastal inundation and pulling in vulnerability models. And like I said, we have this ability to do plug and play because we realize that no one model is the right model um, and it's the ability for people to, to do this evaluation over a series of models to, to understand what the potential impact and the probability of impact is. The final slide. And one thing that we're super excited to announce, which again is related to the work that AgStack has going on, is uh, this week we announced the Sustainable Africa Initiative. So this work isn't just, like I said, for financial institutions and how they invest or corporations and how they transition, but it's also talking about how do we create a public good. So everything that we're building, our tools, our data, our platform, it's all open source. And we've created the Sustainable Africa Initiative where our goal is to provide the continent of Africa with this platform and the tools and the knowledge so that they can do this analysis themselves. And we're starting in Nigeria with the agriculture sector. Most people may not know, but 80% of Nigeria's revenue and income comes from oil and gas. They're the seventh largest oil and gas producer in the world. So when we think about the transition that has to take place in their country, it's pretty significant because they use that money from oil and gas to feed their people, to buy grain and things like that. And obviously their particular area of the world is also subject to extensive chronic uh, drought and flooding as well. So working and giving them the tools so that they can come up with the adaptation programs for their agriculture sector we think is you know a vital public good that that we will provide so if you're interested in learning more or would like to volunteer we have the website up there thanks thank you very much heather um so uh, really excited to be working with our peer group uh, within the linux foundation uh, on this uh, vertical and you know os climate provides a very broad horizontal view on, on climate risk and climate problems, and we can sort of really focus on the agriculture piece. Um, so with that, I'll transition to uh, Brian King uh, from the CGIR, and Brian will introduce uh, some of his slides. Thank you, Samir, and hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining. Um, CGIR, uh, we can just go to the next slide, I think. Actually, let's, let's sorry. Uh, hi, CGIR, uh, we've, we've done uh, so much influential science in the world that we sometimes think people should know who we are. Uh, <laughs> um, we're, we're a consortium of 11 uh, agriculture research institutes uh, centered on really food security in developing economic contexts. Um, and we have geneticists and crop improvement experts, economists, sociologists, climatologists, hydrologists, and uh, really just about any domain that you can think of that intersects with global food security uh, we have expertise in. We're um, sometimes kind of a diffuse organization because each of these institutes is kind of a global institution in its own right. And so um, over the last 10 years or so, we've been finding ways to kind of harness uh, our collective strength across um, those centers. Uh, the fact that we uh, preserve and regenerate some 700,000 uh, food crops in, in gene banks around the world um, that we have research footprint or some level of research activity going on at any given time uh, in over 100 countries. And so I've been, uh, it's been my, my pleasure and privilege to try to serve in a digital innovation role, uh, cutting across those institutes, um, those data stores, and, um, and, and kind of partnering with our researchers to try to achieve impact. Um, so uh, I've already gone through this. It's a really, um, natural complement, um, what I described, that we should be working with the Linux Foundation via AgStack in that um, we default towards open on all of our products. If there is some form of restriction, um, there needs to be a very good reason in terms of the impact of that. So for example, you know, we've partnered with global seed companies, for example, to accelerate development of, of drought tolerant um, uh, varieties of crops, particularly maize. And um, the nature of that engagement was that we, you know, accommodated a, a level of restriction for a, a few years because the global seed companies and all of the smaller seed companies that they work with had the, the infrastructure to get more drought tolerant maize to more people. 
more quickly. Um, but that's kind of the exception rather than the rule is international public goods and open by default. And so um, having the strategic partnership with LF enables us to then look at the digital dimensions of that and what uh, digital public goods for agriculture uh, make sense to co-develop um, and put into the world. So um, this question about uh, field scale measurement is a, it's a, it's a really hard problem. Um, you know, several of the researchers from my organization starting 2011, I believe, um, just kind of started reaching through our partner networks, which are, you know, thousands of other organizations, to start to level set a bit about, okay, what are the different me measurement methodologies? What are the, how crop specific are those? Um, what are the actual data acquisition questions? And then how do we deal with the immense complexity around um, doing that down to smallholder uh, field scale? So, you know, farms that are, that are under a hectare is the kind of formal definition. There can be farms that are smaller than that. Um, and so, you know, several of our researchers um, initiated a process over, and it took a few years, as you can imagine, to kind of start to level set on, on, on these things and, um, and start to build some kind of comparability um, across measurements uh, to kind of, you know, introduce the rigor and, and, and harmonization that's needed at field scale. Let's go to the next slide. So I, I was poking around for an in-field smallholder measurement um, picture. I didn't easily find one. Um, they're out there, I'm sure. Um, but this is actually from my host center in, in Colombia where, um, you know, it's a pretty appropriate tech, uh, low cost way to be measuring gases coming off of, in this case, a rice patty. Um, you know, it looks like a big, you know, plastic jug and it's got and a piece of pipe. Um, and then there's a valve on and you can basically at different points in the crop cycle, you can pull out the gas and you can go and you can analyze those gas. And so this is um, as field uh, scale as it gets in terms of being able to generate a good quality measurement that doesn't cost you a lot of money to do. I mean, your biggest cost is probably the analysis of the gas themselves that once you send them off to somewhere, but we have such a lab. Um, at, at my host center. Uh, the carbon flux towers that we saw, um, uh, you know, I was looking into these recently. I think the cheapest you could get a carbon flux tower is about 50,000 US. Um, we have a couple at my institute. There must be others around the organization, again, speaking to that diffuseness and balkanization I mentioned, but, uh, and those, those were in the neighborhood of 200,000 US. Um, and so, um, you know, this to me screams to, um, you know, for the need for open source IoT, um, uh, open source both on the hardware and on the software sides, so that we can take that, um, that, that consensus around good quality measurement and we can turn it into actual uh, devices and accelerated learning and accelerated technologies um, uh, around that. Next slide. So um, I was really happy to see from OSC uh, and, and learn via Heather, of their risk kind of spatialized uh, um, uh, uh, platform for, for looking at climate risk, climate shocks. And uh, those same researchers or several of those same researchers that I mentioned in that book chapter uh, from, no, actually it's a whole book from 2016, that one was published, um, took that work and then turned it into an analytic um, uh, uh, platform. And so, you know, we too are looking at, I mean, obviously you can see geography, um, and it's only been done for Sub-Saharan Africa at this stage, uh, is my understanding. You know, so we look at climate hazards. And so under the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, you know, you, um, the definitions, you know, the different types of hazards can be kind of slow motion disasters, you know, a trend towards greater drought. Um, they can also be shocks. They can be extreme weather events. And so under climate hazards, spatialized analysis around the kinds of shocks you could be expecting and, um, and the kind of you know, slow motion disasters that we should be prepared for as well um, using the scenarios from IPCC. Um, and then under exposure, that's exposure to crops and to people. And so uh, either you can you know, poke around in the platform and you can go and you can look at cereal crops, legume crops, uh, livestock, and I think a couple more. I have to play around with it again. But um, and then you can look at rural urban distribution as well. And so um, being able to have at least a coarse scale understanding of okay, well, where are the most vulnerable folks? 
uh, smallholder you know, farmers, and what are the kinds of shocks that they should be getting ready for. And then the last bit is um, draws on quite massive literature research in addition to many years of research across all of our institutes into adaptation options, like what particular cropping practices um, would be relevant, or what other options might there be for helping folks that are suddenly have to deal with one of these shocks. Um, last, last slide. And so, um, you know, that data problem is uh, uh, still persists, obviously. I say GHG is no data for one particular recommended adaptation option. Um, you know, so this needs to be, you know, if you go and you search adaptation solutions, you can get by geography, by crop, um, and, and taking into account those hazards. Um, particular uh, adaptation options, particular practices that could be adopted. Um, I think this is a path that we're on um, of, of, for, of you know, data and methods uh, and models um, to, re to capabilities. And, um, and, and it's a path we must be on if we're going to even generate you know, even core scale analysis like this. Um, this was used by the Global Commission on Adaptation and it helped inform, you know, I think a few billion dollars worth of uh, climate finance and, and, you know, development funding and so forth. Um, but it's still very core scale and, um, and not, you know, we need some agility and adaptability in this space if we're going to be ready for the challenges in the coming years. So, thank you. Great, thank you so much, Brian. Um, so let's have a, a couple of rounds of questions for the panel, and then we'll open it up to questions from all of you. And if there's nobody after us, we're delighted to stay on and engage. Uh, so you know, first, let me tell you why I'm here. I, you know, I'm a son of a farmer. My dad, my grandparents were in farming, and you know, I went into tech, and after about a dozen years, you know, decided that I wanted to do something more sort of focused around um, you know transformational things that are globe scale. Uh, and farming and agriculture was a natural fit for me. So let me turn it to first to you, Brian. Uh, you know, this field-based model, you touched on it a little bit. You know, why are you here uh, in terms of your, you know, focus? Uh, what about the field model work is, uh, you know, important for CG and for you? And, and where, do you, where do you see this fit in? I mean, this, um, the, the ability to um, take some of the global models and um, downscale them to the point where we can have a pretty good idea of um, challenges to be navigated at, at smallholder farming scale. Um, you know, as I mentioned, it's just a, it's a really hard problem, and it's the kind of problem that we can only solve through collaboration and, and open learning and open technologies. And so, um, you know, being able to get the the, the, the open science folks together with the open technology folks, digital, open digital technology folks, um, you know, I think we, we, we can make some headway on this um, and accelerate our progress on this. So yeah, yeah. That's, that's why I'm here. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Heather, um, same question for you. Yeah, I'd, uh, definitely plus one what you said. I mean, the climate change, right, isn't going to be solved by one org or, or one company, right? It's it's going to take the entire global village uh, to solve this. And I think partnering with AgStack, especially on our Sustainable Africa initiative and being able to, you know, get field level data is really, really important. And like I said, um, uh, we're not making as much progress as we can to maintain that Paris Accord Agreement of 1.5 1 degrees, right? We're, we're not on a trajectory to hit that. And so being able to get this information and be able to look at other ways to, to mitigate some of the emissions that others are, are still right pumping into the air, I think it's really important. So thank you. Great. Excellent. Yeah. So, you know, from that perspective, um, one of the things that's really exciting possibility for agriculture is to create market incentives for farmers and producers to really, you know, change behaviors that give them, uh, you know, through the incentive, the, the means to essentially uh, create more carbon sequestration. So I'm envisioning carbon markets for agriculture as a new and additional revenue stream for producers. Imagine that, that would change everything, okay? Anybody who's been on a farm knows what margins and the lack thereof are all about, right? I'm really excited about that, but there are so many hurdles. Let me point, you know, you know ask the question around challenges and hurdles, you know, uh, so first with you, Brian, you know, from your perch, what do you see as the systemic challenges to this work as we progress, particularly in light of our partnership? We've inked an MOU with CGIR for being their digital partner 
uh, on their journey. They're the ag first, we're sort of digital first, and so together we can sort of go together. And then we also have OS Climate and others within LF joining us. But, but back to you, Brian, what do you see as the challenges going forward? I think there's, um, there, there's the, the art of the generalizable is really important in this space, like having quicker insights that are, you feel like, you know, are at least 60% right <laughs> is, is, is needed, you know, sort of yesterday. Um, and so, you know, it's a really hard challenge to, to build scientific consensus. It's a really hard challenge to kind of harmonize across methods and approaches. I think um, in the climate space, we're moving into an era where there is enough consensus and enough um, commonality that we can we can sort of you know compare across approaches, but we can also know what they're supposed to add up to. So um, I think the biggest challenge now that that is at a, an inflection point, at least in my perception, um, is how do we you know as I mentioned turn that into capabilities? How do we um, equip humanity you know or the sector? With the the agility um, to you know act on that intelligence and and then learn from that and you know build new intelligence and have that kind of feedback between very localized things like you know data at a point where the 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 um, the, the data was captured with a, a plastic jug you know we know how that fits into the global system and and what to do about it um so it's it's the agility and the adaptability across scales i guess is is the challenge now Heather? yeah and i would add to it like the uh access i think is also really important the access to to that information in a, a way that's meaningful one of the things that we're building as part of the data mesh is what we're calling the data exchange which allows people to be able to what we call the mere mortals you know take those important pieces whether it's that emission information or it's a model or it's you know uh, a jupiter notebook right that the technology to to combine all that into uh, actionable insights i think that's a big piece and then access and, and upskilling. So one of the reasons why we're focused on Nigeria is we're going right now uh, to nine Nigerian universities and giving them the tools and providing them that, that skill and that knowledge so that they can leverage that. And I think that's the other piece is, is making it uh, uh, accessible to others. Great, thank you. So um, thank you to both of you for answering those questions. I'd like to now open it up to uh, the audience for any questions. I think we're at time, but I think don't, there's nobody else behind us. So we can, is there anybody behind us? Yeah. There is? OK. So maybe we can ask maybe one question and then go outside for the rest. Yeah, go ahead. Please use the mic. Please use the mic, yeah. And we'll be outside for the rest. Um, uh, so I live in Abbotsford, uh, just right up the road from Vancouver. <clears throat> it's a, uh, it's a heavily agricultural town, uh, and I engage in a bit of climate activism work in that community. But being a rural community, you know, a lot of the work that we do in climate is kind of victimized by the rural-urban divide. In that, like people in urban centers care a lot about climate change, and people in in rural areas just culturally politically, socially, the climate movement isn't as strong in those areas. But it's also where a lot of agricultural communities are, and they're really the front lines of climate change. So uh, the data and the work that you're doing here is really fantastic. And, and what you mentioned about having uh, carbon markets to be able to liberate these farms from agribusiness and to give them another revenue stream to be able to do good farming and to help the earth instead of having to maximize their yield constantly with the barest of margins like how how is the data and, and systems that you're building um, going towards a, a carbon market like that and, and how realistic is it to expect that that might be a reality at some point one of you want to take before we go outside just quickly yeah, There's a longer question, and we can give a bit longer answer outside, but if you want to quickly address it before we end it. Yeah, I think there's, uh, with all the regulatory activities that are happening, right, uh, globally, whether it's the SEC in the U.S. or EU, uh, there is going to be a lot more pressure, right, on, on uh, emitters, heavy emitters, to find solutions. And I think... Um, 
to me, right? The agriculture sector makes a lot of sense in terms of them planting cover crops and other, you know, perennial crops, right? So that the, that you can get that sequestration and, and hopefully pay them um, to do those goods work. So I so I think the market trends and the pressures are, and the regulatory um, will all play a part in that uh, in moving that forward. Great, thank you so much. Um, so let's we'll take the rest of the questions outside. Let's have a round of applause for our, our panel. Thank you, and thank you for all of you for attending. Appreciate it.